I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about blue light exposure and how that impacts our melatonin and then the quality of our sleep. So we work for months with couples in our couples coaching program on their sleep hygiene. A quick hack for this actually for blue light exposure is to wear blue light blocking glasses. This is something that we recommend for our couples. And this is something that many people get wrong. They may be wearing the wrong type of blue light blocking glasses. There are tons on the market right now. So we're talking about blue light, why that's important for your both female and male fertility and what you can do right now to minimize your exposure. Excited for you to listen to this episode and feel free to leave a review on iTunes. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers and really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. One theme that keeps coming up with the couples in our Fab Fertile Couples Coaching Program is sleep. Whether it's insomnia, having a hard time falling asleep, waking up at night, or feeling tired when we wake up. Sleep is critical for fertility and hormones. And that's why I'm so excited to have Blue Blocks as our podcast sponsor. So we're exposed to blue and green light from our phones, our tablets, our computers, indoor lights, and more. And this exposure impacts our melatonin production. Melatonin is essential for both female and male fertility. It helps determine the frequency and duration of our cycle and impacts sperm. So the there's lots of blue light blocking glasses on the market, but the ones from Blue Blocks, they've actually compared other popular brands and Blue Blocks block 100% of blue and green light while other brands fall short. So I have their sleep glasses. They have red lenses and the ones I have are a little translucent frame. And they're so stylish and really cool. And so they eliminate 100% of the blue and green light in the 400 nanometer to 550 nanometer range. So this is exact range has been shown in clinical studies to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact your sleep. So all you do is wear your sleep glasses after sunset until it's time for bed and you'll notice improved sleep after just one use. And it's also cool to use when you're flying for managing jet lag. I got to say, I was a little skeptical about the noticing uh, improvement after one use, but literally I I use these glasses and my sleep is actually already pretty good. I use them for one day. And I have to say, after one day, I had the best sleep of my life. I just felt so rested. So these glasses, they ship free and they're tracked for all orders anywhere in the world. And also they have all their frames come in prescription, non-prescription and reading glasses. Plus you can send in your frames and they'll add the blue light blocking and green light blocking lenses to your frame. So this is an easy hack that you can add to your fertility toolkit. All you do is go to blue blocks, B-L-U, blox.com use the coupon code get pregnant podcast at checkout and receive a 15% discount that's blue blocks b l u b l o x.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast to receive your 15% discount i didn't need to go to donor eggs obviously mm-hmm. i don't regret it i have beautiful children i could have done things differently restored i was still cycling back in my in my 20s I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF 
the first step because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, the founder of Fab Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Andy Mant to the podcast, and we're digging into the impact blue light has on sleep and why this matters for fertility. Andy Mant is the founder and CEO of Blue Blocks, a company specializing in evidence-based advanced light filtering eyewear. Andy started Blue Blocks after becoming dissatisfied with the quality and standards of blue light blocking glasses available and so set about to design lenses that match the evidence in the academic literature. Thanks so much for listening. I'm so thankful that you are here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Andy, excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on, Sarah. Awesome. Yeah. Can you share your journey and really how you came to do this work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, My journey started um, probably about... Probably about eight years ago, um, I moved to um, I moved to Australia um, from the UK. Um, I was quite overweight at the time. Um, I tried all the sort of conventional dieting techniques that um, doctors prescribed me. None of it really worked. So um, I decided to take matters into my own hands and do a bit of um, bit of research um, in the academic literature and find out really how human biology and physiology really all worked. Found a few sort of dieting protocols that were a little bit sort of left of field, did them, lost a lot of weight and got a, got quite healthy quite quickly. Now, that's what gave me the grounding to sort of really critically look at my health um, from all different aspects. So not just from dieting, but from sort of environment as well. One thing that really... Um, sort of um, was never quite right for me since I was about 14 years old. So probably when I was starting to go through a lot of hormonal changes um, myself, um, mm-hmm. going through puberty, for, for instance, I literally could not sleep well. Um, mm-hmm. No matter what I did, um, you know, I, I just, I would wake up three or four times in the night. I, I really wouldn't have much dream recall or, or dreams at all. Um, and I'd just be sort of feeling like I was going through life like a bit of a zombie. I mean, I was okay when I was younger, but as the years went on, it got worse and worse. So I, I, again, from the grounding, from looking into the dieting side of things, um, I discovered that, you know, a big thing that humans have that governs sleep and hormones and health is, is something called a circadian rhythm. Now that's uh, like a, a, basically our body clock for a better word. It runs on a 24 hour cycle. It matches the, the rotation of the earth and is governed by light and dark cycles. So, when I researched that, um, I found that, you know, if you artificial light or light at the wrong times of the day into your, into your routine, that can disrupt the clock, which can disrupt your hormones and disrupt your sleep. So when I was reading on, I found that, um, you know, by blocking some of the frequencies of blue and green light that comes from basically any artificial light source, whether it be your house lights, your TV, your smartphone, your, your fridge light, anything like that. If you could block the blues and the greens that were coming out of that, you could actually increase melatonin and get better sleep. So I jumped on Amazon, as we do, sort of um, bought myself a couple of pairs of of blue light blocking glasses, you know, about 20 bucks each, popped them on. And for the first couple of weeks, I had slightly improved sleep. And I was like, okay, there's definitely something to this. Now, I was fortunate enough that I had some friends in an optics laboratory here in Australia. And as I read more and more on the academic literature, Um, it became very clear that there was a very specific range of light that one needed to block um, in order to get the the best and most optimal melatonin secretion and the best sleep. And that was between 400 and 550 nanometers of light, which is all of the blue light and half of the green light spectrum. So what I did was I ordered probably 20 different brands of glasses. And I took them to my friend in the optics lab and said, I want you to test these for your spectrometer and tell me exactly what frequencies of light all these glasses are blocking. And these are all your well-known big selling brands. Mm-hmm. Um, the results came back in like a few weeks later and every single one of those glasses did not block all of the blue light, let alone even any in the green spectrum. So, you know, these glasses were, you know, probably at worst a placebo, but at best sort of, you know, only blocking really half of what you needed to block. So really not being optimal. So I said to, to my friends in the lab, I said, look, if, 
if I give you some specifications to design a lens for me that blocks exactly 100%, 400 to 550 nanometers of light, could you do that? And they were like, yeah, no problem. And that was how Blue Blocks was born. We, we mm. created these lenses, um, I, I guess specifically for, for your listeners, the, the red sort of lens, the, the 400 to 450 nanometer lenses is the perfect one for, um, for sort of fertility, pregnancy, and, and sort of reproductive health. But we also d- developed some daytime ones as well to help sort of light management during the day because our needs change um, from day to night. So that was really how Blue Blocks was, was born. And, you know, what we found was that, you know, all those cheapy pairs that you buy on Amazon don't do the job that they're saying they're going to do. Because a lot of people say, well, why would I pay loads for, you know, one brand when I can get them cheaper, you know, elsewhere. But the, the fact of the matter is they're not all created equal. Um, Blue Blocks was created um, and, and all manufactured and designed here in Australia, whereas, you know, all the other cheap ones are, are mass produced in a factory, not an optics lab. So, you know, that was really how we came to be. And um, yeah, to this day, we've, we've been helping thousands of people really regain their sleep, their health, their, their, their hormones and um, general well-being. Well, that's amazing. Really kind of out, of out of necessity for yourself, as you're saying, when you were 14, those sleep issues, and then wait a minute, what's, you know, what's going to work? And then discovering, so it's 400 to 500 nanometers, you said? 400 to 550 nanometers. Okay. Um, so yeah, so light runs in spectrum. So think of like the rainbow that you'll see on a sort of sunny slash rainy day. That's all the colors of, of light that we can see um, through, our, through our eye that are visible. Um, so you've got, you know, your blues, your, your greens, your yellows, your ambers, and your reds. And it's each one has a spectral sort of frequency. So blue, for instance, is 400 to 495 nanometers. So all of that needs to be blocked after dark because it just isn't present from an ancestral point of view. And then 496 to 570, for instance, is the green light spectrum and blocking green up to 550 is essential for for sleep. So each frequency of light has different properties. For instance, if you look at the red light spectrum, um, which is the, the very sort of end of the light spectrum, those properties of light are extremely healing and relaxing. And when you actually look at I guess, from an ancestral point of view, what colors of light are given out by the campfire. It's reds and oranges, very restorative, very relaxing, very calming, doesn't interfere with melatonin production and sleep. So what we're trying to do with, um, you know, blue blocks is to not say to people, right, after dark, switch off all, or after sunset, sorry, switch off all your lights, don't watch TV, switch, put your candles on, and that's that's your life now, and you're Mm -hmm. gonna get great sleep. We appreciate that, you know, this this, these technological revolutions that we've been in, you know, we've got amazing TVs, laptops, smartphones can still be used as long as you're managing the light that is emitted from them. So let's just go into blue light for a little bit. So there are some benefits for blue light as opposed to just obviously during the day. So what are the benefits for, for blue light? Yeah, absolutely. So blue light, every frequency of light has a purpose. Okay. It's just when we use that light mm-hmm. in relation to our circadian rhythm to keep our hormones, sleep and um, health in check. Now, blue light is emitted from the sun. Um, do you know why we can tell this? Because when you look at the sky, it's blue. So blue light is present in the sun. Now, blue light during the day does something very special for us. It raises something called cortisol, um, which is like a, a sh- people call it a stress hormone, but it really is only the stress hormone if it's kept at chronic levels or mm-hmm. it's that the specific circadian cycle of cortisol is, is switched, but we can come onto that later and how that works. But cortisol during the day is an essential hormone that's released, and it's released by blue light. So as as you get up in the morning and maybe you watch the sunrise, the light that is emitted in, in that sort of blue range will spike your cortisol. It will increase something called dopamine, and it will also start production of serotonin. Now, all these neurotransmitters and hormones are uh, basically what's needed in a... Um, you know, in a species like us that is active during the day to keep us active and alert. So it really keeps us sort of, you know, cognizant to everything around us. It keeps us, um, you know, in a state of awakeness, for, for want of a better word. The, the thing with blue light from the flip side, so that's why it's beneficial. From the flip, flip side on why it's bad is that blue light, whatever form it's in, so whether it's in the sun naturally or whether it's in artificial light, it causes not only, you know, cell damage to the eyes, um, it also causes mitochondrial damage as well. Now, the sun has an antidote in it that I briefly touched upon a few minutes ago, which is red light. So any damage that the sun causes from blue light passing through your eyes is undone and repaired by the restorative red frequencies that are in the sunlight. So if you look at sunlight from a spectral analysis sort of standpoint, 
all the colors are equal. So you've got equal amount of blue to green to yellow to orange and to red. And they all balance each other out in, in perfect harmony. But where blue light is bad is when you look at LED and artificial light sources, so fluorescent, LED, halogen, those types of light sources, you will see that not all of the colors are present um, in those lights. So you might see it as like a white light, but in that, when you test it with a spectrometer, there's very high amounts of blue light, very high amounts of green light, and really not a lot of other visible light. So there's really not much um, amber and red in there at all, if any. So what that's doing is during the day is that when you're looking at your computer screen or you're working in an office or watching TV and you're under artificial light, you're getting all the damage to the cells in your eyes and your skin and your mitochondria, but you're not actually getting any of the restorative red frequencies that are going to repair that damage. So it leads to things like digital eye strain. It leads to things like macular degeneration, headaches, migraines, and you just generally feel quite stressed. Your cortisol levels will be chronically high, which can lead to stress, anxiety, depression, which can then have a knock-on effect later on in the day when you're trying to sleep. Now, blue light is devastating after dark because during the day, blue light's great because it creates something called serotonin. Um, and serotonin is needed in the evening and in the absence of blue and green light to create melatonin. Now, melatonin does two things. It helps us get into a deep restorative sleep, and it also is a very powerful antioxidant. So it helps scavenge free radicals, repair any cell damage during the day. And it's also present in, in basically all of the sort of reproductive areas um, in both men and, and women, mm -hmm. which we can come on to later. So if we expose ourselves through our eyes mainly, um, the skin has some effect as well with blue light, but through our eyes mainly after dark. So if we're coming home after dark, we're switching on the lights, we're looking in the fridge to make a meal, maybe we're putting the dishwasher on, which has a blue artificial light diode on it, maybe we're watching TV. That's going to send a message to our brain to keep cortisol levels high, to not produce melatonin and basically tell us it's daytime. We don't need to sleep. We don't need to sleep as well. Um, so this is, this is why there's such a big problem with, with sleep these days is because we're just exposing ourselves to light 24 seven and not allowing our body any time to get into proper sleep and recover any damage that's caused by, you know, environmental stimuli during the day. Yeah. And we're seeing this regularly with the couples that we're working with. So basically when we're doing the Dutch test, the dried urine test, looking at your cortisol levels and your sex hormones, and we can actually, and also a test for melatonin. Sometimes people are supplementing with, with melatonin, so it can be super high. A lot of the times, which is not a good idea either, um, but a lot of the times we see it low, and then we see the cortisol is 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 not in the right balance either. And then we're, when we're talking to the, the client, it's like, oh, wait a minute, they have dysregulated sleep, either they're having a hard time. We see this a lot with people they get that second wind and they're like, oh, I can't get to bed until after midnight or one, they're up. And they kind of sometimes they'll even fall asleep on the couch around eight and then they get that second wind and then they're, they're up later. And then that cycle goes on and on and on and then they're getting up during the night and they're, they're, they're not getting that restorative sleep. So let's dig into um, melatonin, why that's important for female fertility. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, from a female fertility perspective, Basically, the, the, the studies that are out there that we've read shows that melatonin plays such a vital role in egg fertilization and embryo viability. Mm -hmm. So if we are exposing ourselves to blue and green light after dark, we're not going to be getting the optimal amounts of, of melatonin into our um, released into our bloodstream. Now, that isn't just a, um, you know, an issue with falling asleep, um, as we've, we've seen in the studies. This isn't an issue that will damage, I guess, or impair the role, uh, I guess, the uh, mechanisms that are in place that actually allow the egg fertilization process and the viability of the embryo. So for me, um, when you read the literature, um, it's very clear that you want to keep those melatonin levels as high as possible without supplementation. Supplementation is bad because yeah. you're taking an, an exogenous hormone. You don't know what levels are safe or what levels your body are, you know, is happily to happy to produce naturally so you're better off you know blocking that blue and green light after dark and i guess what what happens is when melatonin is disrupted as well um after dark you actually get disrupted circadian rhythms and a misaligned melatonin circadian rhythm because everything runs on a circadian rhythm so if you misalign your melatonin circadian rhythm it makes it much more difficult to conceive um so melatonin plays such a vital role in 
you know, not only sleep, but also, you know, female reproduction as, as well. Yeah. And using melatonin for low melatonin as a band-aid approach is kind of like, well, why is it bad in the first place? And looking at, you know, we're looking at the whole body and this, as we're talking about this um, today, looking at sleep and digging into what can, with, with the blue light, what can you be exposed in that? Is that impacting your melatonin? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, you know, from a, a different standpoint, I guess, from sort of the reproductive health side of things, um, you know, melatonin is also, you know, a lot of people think melatonin is just produced in the, um, in the pineal gland. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, most of it is, um, but it's also produced at other different sites in the body as well. And two very important sites, I guess, in, in the female reproductive side of things is that melatonin is produced in very large quantities in the ovaries and placenta. So basically what happens when it's produced in the, in the ovaries and placenta, placenta is it's there to protect against cellular damage arising from oxidative stress. Now, there's very high oxidative stress occurring in those regions. There's, there's constant cycles going on. Obviously, the placenta is a, a place where, you know, nutrients and, 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 and what have you pass through, to the, um, pass through to the child as well. So the placenta in itself is actually particularly susceptible to free radical generation. And as I mentioned earlier, melatonin isn't just a sleep hormone. It is the most powerful antioxidant that we can produce naturally. And it's secreted in high levels at this junction. As long as our, as long as after dark, we are not exposed to blue and green light. Melatonin can only be produced after sunset in the absence of blue and green light. So if you could, if you're com- coming home and again, exposing yourself to blue light after dark, you're actually going to be allowing free radical generation to not be addressed by melatonin naturally in those areas, the placenta and also the ovaries. Um, and, you know, having a, a good level of melatonin present at those sites is, is optimal in, you know, maintaining ovary and placental health as well. And I guess as well with, with poor melatonin levels, um, you can actually leave yourself more susceptible to, I guess, really long-term issues that could arise like you know you could have things like ovarian cancer rate sort of susceptibility could increase because you're not clearing out the free radical generation the inflammation in those areas you know inflammation is a natural process um, but melatonin is nature's way of clearing that out and, and allowing cells to function correctly but you can also when you actually look into the peer-reviewed and clinical studies people that have complications during pregnancy typically also have poor sleep and poor low melatonin levels. Mm. There's also um, another body of evidence, and and this is very, very strong evidence. There's been many clinical trials done on it that show that disrupted circadian rhythms, um, which would be, you know, inappropriate light hygiene after dark um, and during the day, can actually also increase the risk of breast cancer in women as well. Um, Now, there was an interesting study that came out several weeks ago that showed that the skin has its own circadian rhythm independent of the master clock. So the way the skin's um, circadian clock works is that during the day, it just basically it's in an active phase. So it allows itself to, you know, be active, protect you against, um, or sorry, allow sort of, you know, UV light from outside to pass through the body to create vitamin D and do other bits and pieces during the day as well that help, you know, us function during the day. Um, after dark, the cells in the skin actually switch over to repair mode. So maybe too much UV light was taken in. Maybe there were some pollutants that got around your skin and caused a bit of inflammation. And it goes into repair mode after dark. But in this particular study, when they actually shone artificial light onto the skin after the dark, after sorry, after dark, the skin did not go into repair mode which meant that the skin wasn't able to repair any of the damage or inflammation during the day. What that does is, in, in, from a breast cancer point of view, is if we're getting a lot of damage on our skin during the day from you know, external environmental sources, and then we're having blue light after dark in our environment, we're actually not going to allow our skin to repair any of the damaged cells in there. And we all know that damaged cells can lead to, I guess, Um, mutations in cells over time, which could actually lead to cancer as well, which is why breast cancer rates are always very much associated with low melatonin levels as well in in women. I guess from a a male point of view as well, um, low melatonin levels have also been shown to correlate with higher rates of prostate cancer in men. Um, You know, this is a a cancer that's very much on the rise. um, And it's also been shown to 
decrease sperm quality and quantity as well. But we can come on a little bit more onto that um, specifically a bit later on. And the final, I guess, um, two points to make is, is, is during, I guess, pregnancy and birth. So majority of, of births, when you look at the records, actually happen between about midnight and 3, 4 a.m. Um, in, in the morning. And the reason for that is that's when melatonin levels, 2 a.m. specifically, are at their highest. And when you look at the, I guess, the, the biophysics behind why, I guess, delivery is promoted at that specific time of the day, is that it, melatonin has to synergize with something called oxytocin, um, which then induces pregnancy, um, sorry, it induces birth. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is why the majority of these births happen at night when melatonin levels are highest. So, you know, if we're, again, exposing ourselves inappropriately to blue and green light after dark, we could be complicating the pregnancy, which we touched upon earlier. Studies have shown because we haven't got high enough levels of melatonin to be able to synergize properly with the oxytocin, oxytocin to induce that um, that birth. And I guess from other from from another standpoint as well on melatonin, and, and I could probably cover this off later, but I'm going to cover it off now because it's such an important study, and we can probably delve into it. Because you're probably going to have loads of questions on it. Is that Women's breast milk, when the baby has been born, is actually runs on its own circadian rhythm as well. And then yeah, three months that, ago, yeah. yeah, so three months ago, a study came out that showed that um, breast milk is a, is a key driver of creating a circadian rhythm in in your in your newborn because babies aren't born with a circadian rhythm. They um, they need to develop it through appropriate light and dark cycles, but also it appears now through mother's breast milk. So what they did was they did an experiment where they pumped breast milk during the day and they pumped breast milk after sunset. The breast milk that they pumped during the day was high in cortisol. As we said earlier, mm-hmm. you know, a proper circadian rhythm would be high cortisol during during the morning and, and sort of early afternoon and then tapering off during the evening. So baby would then get fed that milk during the day. Um, the cortisol would tell the brain, right, it's daytime to be alert and awake and, and slowly entrain that circadian rhythm. When they tested the milk secreted after dark, there was no cortisol levels present in that milk, but very high levels of melatonin and tryptophan, which is very interesting because tryptophan has to mix with serotonin in the gut to create more melatonin after dark in the absence of blue and green light. And obviously we know that melatonin is a big entrainer of circadian rhythms and sleep. So it was just, it just was very, very interesting that, you know, mothers that might not be breastfeeding, um, directly to their child themselves whenever the child wants it could be delaying or disrupting circadian rhythms in their newborn because they might be pumping milk during the day and then giving that to their baby for a night feed, which is very high in cortisol. Cortisol causes us to, you know, to basically be alert and awake. It causes an awakening response in us. Um, and it keeps us, you know, not wanting to go back to sleep or waking up frequently because it's basically telling us we don't need the melatonin at that time. So it's very important that mothers really label their breast milk. You know, I secreted this during the day at this time. I secreted this breast milk um, after sunset. And then, you know, if, if mum or dad is getting up in the night to do a night feed, it's very important to choose the correct bottle um, of milk or you're going to disrupt your, your child's circadian rhythms. And it's also... Um, also very evident as well that if a mother has a disruptive circadian rhythm during pregnancy, the onset of the baby's circadian rhythm can actually be impaired. But it, more importantly, it can actually cause things like behavioral and psychological issues in the child as well if the mother has a disrupted circadian rhythm. All these studies can be sent over. If anyone wants to read them, I, I can send over the peer-reviewed studies yeah, to support sure. these claims. So that was very interesting as well. And what you find with, you know, this, you know, it takes about three to six months to entrain a, a baby's circadian rhythm. So, you know, when you look at it from a modern day perspective, the chrononutrition side of things with the breast milk is a big issue. I reckon a lot of mums will, you know, find a lot of relief in just labeling breast milk that they've pumped and, and allowing their child to to actually have the correct milk and hormones at the correct time of the day. But also, you know, mum and dad might be getting up in the middle of the night to do a night feed and they're going into the baby's room, switching on artificial light, which is then sending a message to both mum and dad and the baby that it's daytime and to, to spike cortisol levels again. So it's very important to ensure that the environment where you're doing night feeds and your baby is sleeping, there is no artificial standard LED light present. Um, and what we recommend to a lot of um, new mums, and, and a lot have done it with massive success, 
is to put red light bulbs in um, in the baby's feeding room and in, in their room. So if you need to feed the baby during the night, which is inevitable, you go in, you switch on the, the red light. None of that disrupts anyone's hormones that are present. Melatonin levels are kept high and secreting. And then you can go back to sleep almost in instantly without having high sleep latency. So it's little hacks like that as well, Sarah, that allow, you know, the baby's rhythm to not be disrupted and to entrain correctly and quicker, but also not to disrupt mum and dad's sleep, you know, because if mum and dad are getting up in the night to do the feeds and then they're struggling to get back to sleep, that's going to just grate on them like over the, over the months and months that they're doing this to the point where they're just going to be exhausted. And we see so many new parents just at mm -hmm. the point of, of breaking because they're so tired yet there is such an easy hack to reduce that fatigue. And that is wearing your blue light glasses after dark to get a better quality of sleep. Maybe even wearing those blue light glasses when you're getting up in the night to do the night feed, but having that red light present in your home in the baby's feeding area. So you're not disrupting those, um, you know, deep and REM sleeps. Yeah. It's interesting with the, the day and night with it, making sure that AM and PM is, is labeled there. So you're not then having your baby, you wondering why your baby's up all night long. Well, wait a minute, we gave you the, the, the milk with the cortisol that got the baby wanting to have a party time in the middle of the night and <laughs> vice, vice versa. Yeah. And I, I have some of those, oh, those salt, the salt rock lamps, which I guess is red, is red light, but I don't have a, any other red light in my, my house, but intuitively I've always liked to dim the light at, at, at night and really I didn't like all that really harsh light. I know when I was nursing my children, I stumbled in there in the dark, but um, yeah, having the, the, the red light around there is um, yeah. Then there's something there. It, it is just very common. It just doesn't interfere with, um, with hormones um, in terms of um, the cortisol side of things. So, you know, red light is not just a healing form of light, you know, it's, it's a very calming form of light as well. And, you know, you're probably, I guess people can relate to it if you go camping um, mm. and you are, you know, in the middle of a forest or wherever you're camping, um, maybe you build a campfire, um, sit around that campfire and you typically then go to bed and have the best night's sleep you possibly have. And, mm. you know, number one, you're not surrounded by copious amounts of light pollution inside and outside your home because you're typically in the middle of the woods somewhere. But also that red light just makes you feel so relaxed and, and calm and, and just feeling, you know, ready to, to sleep and relax. Um, you know, there's, there's no coincidence that when you go into some sort of retreats and spas and, and meditation type environments that, you know, salt lamps are, are usually mm -hmm. present, which is, you know, that very sort of pinky, orange, um, amber, red type colors, which make you feel very relaxed and, and soothed. So, you know, light is, is extremely important. And a lot of people really dismiss it in favor of, you know, good nutrition and exercise. And, and they don't realize how different frequencies of light have a massive impact on how you feel. Um, and even in the treatment of specific issues as well, like red light, for instance, um, in the invisible range, so a near infrared and infrared range is, is, is used very and, and shown very clearly in the evidence to, um, you know, heal and restore and to repair damaged cells at a sort of muscular level and red light, you know, at a, at a visible level, mainly in that sort of 630 to 660 nanometer range is, is fantastic for, um, collagen production in the skin as well. So, you know, my wife uses a, a red light therapy device every evening because, it restores collagen, um, keeps the skin healthy, delays aging, causes, um, you know, repair of any skin damage that may have happened, um, during the day as well. So red light's very important as well. And, and every single color in the, in the spectrum has an important role to play in, in human health and well-being. Yeah. Also good for thyroid and hair. And, um, I had my eye on, uh, Juve for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And okay, so for male fertility and melatonin, you talked about um, sperm quality or sperm count and motility. Anything else you'd like to share there with um, how it impacts male fertility? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, melatonin is, um, is basically the key to good sleep. And then I guess a lot of where reproductive issues occur is through inadequate sleep quality. So sleep, for instance, has three phases. It has light, deep, and REM sleep. And we need all three phases to be healthy. And typically when you um, don't have high levels of melatonin production by avoiding blue light after dark is you really only have light sleep and maybe a little bit of REM sleep. That's the importance of melatonin. So 
with men, as with women, I guess, as, as well, um, melatonin actually controls reproductive hormones in men. It disrupts, disrupts circadian rhythms, as we've mentioned. It decreases sperm quality and quantity. So some studies and some facts here that, um, that are quite interesting is that it's also not just short sleep duration, but also very long sleep duration in men can actually negatively impact their fertility. So for instance, there was one particular study released many years ago um, that showed that men who slept too much or not enough were actually about 42%, I think I remember, 42% less likely to conceive with their partner. So if your partner is, you know, maybe going to bed late, getting up early, or maybe going to bed early, waking up late, you're going to have a harder time conceiving than someone who has a, a more healthy sleep pattern, which might be, say, 9 or, nine or 10 p.m. in bed and up at, with the sunrise. Um, you know, that's important to say as well that a, a correct sleep cycle is typically in line with light and dark cycles. So by that, that means that about one to four hours after sunset, you want to be in bed asleep. Um, I say one to four hours because it depends on the season. Daylight savings has messed a lot of it up for a lot of us, um, but that's a different, probably a different conversation. Um, and it's also rising with the sunrise. The reason you need to rise with the sunrise is because that is the first light of the day, which is going to send a message to your brain that, right, I need to entrain and start my body clock ticking for the correct hormone secretion during the rest of the day. And this is why I personally get up and recommend that everyone gets up with the sunrise because that's the exact moment nature wants your circadian rhythm to start. So that's the sort of precursor to a good day of hormones and a good night's sleep later on during the day. But in men as well, testosterone is, is, is obviously key. We all know that to be the male sex hormone. Low testosterone levels have also been shown to produce lower sperm counts. There's definitely no surprises there. Mm -hmm. But two factors that have the biggest impact on testosterone is chronic stress levels. As I alluded to earlier, chronic stress levels can be induced by a disruptive cortisol cycle. So for instance, if you're exposed to blue light after dark, you're going to be flipping and reversing your cortisol cycle. So it'll be low in the mornings. So you'll probably wake up feeling fatigued and sluggish. And then it will be high at night, which will make you feel alert and awake. These are really bad for um, male testosterone and, and general mm -hmm. health and well-being and sleep, to be fair. But also poor sleep um, is a big, big influencer negatively on, on testosterone levels. So another study that was really important, again, came out probably about 10 years ago, was on looking at, I guess, male sleep um, and how it affected testosterone. And it appears that the majority of testosterone is actually produced when we sleep. And when, I guess, I talk a little bit more about some other hormones later on in the conversation, because, you know, like prolactin and estrogen are also big hormones as well for women in terms of reproductive health. These hormones are all produced when we sleep in their highest quantities. So, you know, quality sleep is going to mean a, a much more optimal secretion of these specific hormones and testosterone is one of those. So the studies have shown that basically the quality and quantity of sperm run on their own circadian rhythms. When we go back to this specific study that I was mentioning earlier, I think it was about 10 years ago, they collected semen from men, male subjects before 7am. So sort of, you know, in the morning with sunrise. Um, and they also collected semen from the same group of people much later point during the day. And what they found was that when they collected sperm in the early hours of the morning around about sunrise, the male subjects had much higher sperm counts and concentration when compared with the semen they collected much later in the day. So as you can see, testosterone is produced in high levels during the evening, but peaks around about sunrise. So you know, if you're getting a good quality sleep, so you're getting up at sunrise, you're going to bed, you know, maybe nine, 10 o'clock at night, your testosterone levels are going to be really, really positively impacting the quality and concentration of the sperm, which means that based on, I guess, the evidence that we're seeing, the best time to, you know, be looking to conceive might be around about that sunrise time, um, you know, seven, seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning, maybe. And it's also really interesting to, to look as well on the seasonality of testosterone levels and the quality and quantity of sperm. And when you actually look at the literature, and this all rings true because, you know, and I, I can hear what people will be saying um, to it when I, when I disclose this, but testosterone levels and the quality and quantity of sperm has a seasonal circadian rhythm, which basically means that in the spring, sperm count is at its highest. And it actually then decreases steadily during the summer months. 
So when you actually look at, I guess, nature from, you know, other species of animals, spring is the sign of birth and re rebirth and, and new life. You know, the birds start to mate and, and have their babies, um, you know, new lambs are born, etc. So it really, humans are no different. There's a seasonality to sperm quality and quantity. So the springtime is, you know, an epic time to be looking to conceive for, um, for humans and also, you know, in the early hours of the, of the morning as well. Now, another, another big issue for men, um, I guess is, is something called, and, and not many people probably would have heard of this. Maybe people on your podcast would because they're sort of in tune with this kind of thing is ASA. So anti sperm antibodies. Mm-hmm. So what that does is, is, is I guess in, in very basic layman's terms is, is it destroys sperm, which obviously is not good if you're looking to conceive. Um, and when we look at studies around ASA, men who fall asleep past midnight are basically going to have higher ASA levels than men that went to bed between 10 o'clock and midnight. Mm. So this goes, again, coincides with what I've been sort of going on about this whole podcast is that, you know, people that go to bed earlier and wake earlier are going to have much healthier sex hormones than people that go to bed late and wake up early or go to bed late and wake up late. Um and the group that also went to sleep post midnight also recorded lower sperm counts. No surprise because ASA levels will be higher um, than the group that went early to bed. So, you know, if there's a lot of women listening to this podcast, you know, you're going to take some great tips away on how to, I guess, improve your own reproductive health and, and I guess, chances of conception and also how to look after the, the baby, I guess, from a circadian standpoint once they're born. But you also need to get your, um, your man sort of doing a few, um, a few hacks as well in order to, you know, increase that chance of conception. You know, you want him going to bed between probably 9 and 11 p.m. at night. You want him getting up with a sunrise. Um, you want him to be wearing blue light blocking glasses after dark to increase his melatonin levels, which will increase his sleep and give him a higher sperm count and concentration and higher testosterone levels. So, you know, there's lots of, you know, good hacks in there to, to improve both the, you know, reproductive health of, of male and females. Yeah. That's why we coach men and women because it's to, it takes two to tangle, you know, know, it's women that normally come to me, but there's lots of things, even though, even if it's, we're dealing primarily with female factor infertility, there's lots of things that a man can do to improve his sperm quality and um, motility as we talked about there. So that's awesome. Um, and so how do we know if we are getting uh, good quality sleep then? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things uh, very similar to diets. You don't know it until you've actually, you know, you don't know you're eating well until you actually eat well. So I guess the factors regards to good quality sleep is you will, um, you will fall asleep quicker. Okay. So latency to fall asleep, you want to be falling asleep between maybe three to seven minutes from lying in bed. If you've got a cross by that immediately, you're not having good quality sleep. Okay. Your latency is, is very important to get you into that sleep state very quickly. Um, if you are not having dreams, you're not getting into a REM state sleep. Um, so that's your sort of rapid eye movement. That's how you dream, um, which is, you know, processing the information that um, maybe has been taken in during the day, but also processing sort of feelings and um, sort of hormonal and neurotransmitter responses as well. So if you're not dreaming, you're not getting good quality sleep. If you don't recall your dreams, you're not getting good quality deep sleep. Okay. If you wake up feeling sluggish and fatigued, you're not getting good deep sleep. Okay. So these are all very important factors that coincide to an appropriate sleep cycle. You're getting your light, your deep and your REM sleep. Um, it's, it's one of those things. And I mean, you and I have spoken about this, Sarah, as well, that it's one of those things that, you know, with, I guess, blue light glasses and wearing them after dark, it's hard to sort of comprehend how much of a positive impact this will have on people's sleep because you don't know it until you've tried it. Again, it's like dieting. You've got to try it to, to realize that, you know, maybe the, the, the current lifestyle and diet protocol you're following is not most optimal, but when you change it, you feel fantastic after, a, you know, X amount of time. And the same is true with blue light glasses. Um, but the efficacy of, of using blue light glasses after dark on your sleep is one night. Yeah, because I, I read that one night and I thought, well, geez, that seems quite a, quite a claim. And literally, I used the glasses in one night. I'm like, wow, I didn't realize that I, I hadn't been dreaming a lot um, in the last little while. My, and my sleep's normally quite quite good. 
fall asleep right away and don't don't wake up. And but yeah, my uh, one night of wearing these glasses, the blue light gla- blocker glasses, yeah, all of a sudden I had was having great dreams again. I'm like, oh, I forgot <laughs> that I wasn't having those because I used to always have them on a regular basis. So it was really interesting. Um, just a very short period of time. And then, yeah, so I started wearing them about three hours in the evening, depending on what I'm doing, if I'm watching TV or on the computer or looking at my, my phone, I just have them on. And yeah, there's a, there's a real calming effect that happens with, cause it's got that red, that red campfire glow. Right. And the only, the only thing I say, if you're watching a show and you're trying to see if what, you know, someone's wearing for their outfits, that the, that the colors are a little off there. <laughs> Yes, you're red. The blue and, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So it changes. I guess the color of wearing the the red lenses after dark is a, a lot of people think that everything appears red, which which isn't the case. No. Um, you know, there's like a sort of a warm hue in the background um, of of the colors, and blues will change to sort of blacks and deep greens, and greens mm-hmm. will change to a different shade of greens. All the other colors will will remain somewhat the, the same. But you know, it's one of those things that you get used to as well. You know, after a few weeks, you're you'll forget to wear them one night and you'll realize how much you need these glasses and you need to wear them and you need to sleep um you know how, how much they, they they positively impact your sleep so you know i guess sort of going back to the original question if you're feeling if you're crashing during the day um so sort of late afternoon you know that sort of two to four o'clock slump you're having bad sleep if you can't get sleep quickly you're not having good sleep if you can't recall your dreams you're not having good sleep if you're not dreaming you're not having good sleep um, and if you're going to bed late, you're not getting good sleep. And if you're g- waking up after sunrise in the morning, you're not getting good sleep. So those are the things to, to have a look at on your checklist. If any of those are across, you're not having the best sleep you could possibly be having. And the importance to get the glasses that are 400 to 550 uh, nanometers. So it's, it's blocking up that uh, blue and green light. Exactly. Because the, the thing is, the, the human eye doesn't doesn't care if you block... in that range or 0% in that range. All it takes is one frequency of that light to pass through the inner retina, stimulate the IPRGC cells and and activate melanopsin in the eyes to actually really damage and disrupt your sleep and and stop melatonin secretion. So you've got to ensure that 100% of light from 400 to 550 nanometers is blocked. If it isn't, then you might as well not wear the glasses. Your, Your brain doesn't know the difference between... 1% 1% of light in that range coming and hitting your eyes and, and 99%. Mm-hmm. So share with us your light management protocol. What does that look like? Absolutely. And, and, and everyone should be trying to do this. I mean, mm-hmm. night shift workers, it's it's a whole completely different conversation. You could probably record a whole conversation on night shift. It's just the Actually, worst yeah. thing. Can, can you do anything short on that? Because I work with a lot of um, people in the medical field. So um, yeah. anything you'd like to share there? Yeah, absolutely. So in a nutshell, um, you re- you're reversing your circadian cycle. So your hormones are going to be completely reversed. Anyone that works night shift, and this is probably going to sound like me, you know, sort of not giving any hope in, in this situation, but everyone that works in a night shift um, uh, type profession, which unfortunately is, is very rewarding and, 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 you know, essential careers like nurses, firemen, et cetera, police mm-hmm. are going to have a dramatic increase in all cause metabolic mortality. Um, so things like susceptibility to cancer, diabetes, obesity, heart disease is going to go through the roof because we're not living in um, the correct circadian environment. We're also, night shift workers are not going to be exposed to the same amount of sunlight as people that are active during the day. And sunlight is essential both both invisible and visible spectrum wise in, in training circadian rhythms, but also managing hormone health and neurotransmitter secretion. Um, so look, people that work night shifts need to put serious hacks in place. Number one, they need to try and get out of that profession, and and you know if if, if they want to live a, you know have a, have a uh, a better chance of I guess a more disease free life and healthy life. But a lot won't and can't. And and you know I I really, you know, please people want to do that type of career because without it, you know we we would all be screwed. It's very selfless. Um, they would just have to take bigger sort of light management protocols like they would need to wear yellow lenses during the, their night shift because the intensity and harshness of um, blue light in the after sort of sunset periods is is much more intense so they need more blue light protection without blocking all of it during the day because they still want cortisol levels to be high during that time of the day um, but they also need to be outside as much as they can up 
during the, I guess, the hours that they're off. Um, so obviously they need to sleep as well during, during the daytime. So they've got to ensure that, you know, they're getting some sunlight, you know, before and after they wake, um, which is then similar to, I guess, people that are active during the day. Um, but they also need to do things like grounding. They need to lower EMF levels in their home because their information levels are going to be high from working night shifts. They probably want to look at taking ice cold baths or showers to reduce inflammation from the night shift. Very difficult to do, but you can get into the practice of doing that kind of thing. Um, they also, three hours before they want to go to sleep, they need to be wearing red lens blue blockers that block 400 to 550 nanometers, such as our Sleep Plus glasses. Um, but the big important thing for sleep um, for night shift workers is their sleep environment. During the day, temperatures are going to be higher, which will impair sleep quality. So you need to be sleeping in a temperature controlled environment. You also need zero light entering your work, um, in entering your, your sleep environment. So blackout curtains, 100% light blocking sleep mask, earplugs, very essential to good night's sleep. And then they should, you know, lower that, you know, lower their risk of, of I guess, increasing, you know, all cause mortality rates. So, you know, number one, try and quit that and get back to a daytime um, active existence. But if you can't, then those types of hacks are going to be, you know, really beneficial. It's probably something I should blog on soon as well and write an article on because um, there's a lot of hacks that people can do. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, it's it's really the worst thing you can do for your health um, night shift. So I guess from my point of view, my, mm -hmm. my light day, so anyone that's active during the day needs to follow this as much as they can. It doesn't matter about the seasons it doesn't matter if it's rainy or cloudy outside light still passes through the clouds and, and still helps to entrain your rhythm so i get up with the sunrise I've, i haven't set an alarm now for many years um my circadian rhythm is so in tune with the rising sun that it will wake me up um just before um which is which is fantastic because my hormones are, are, are spot on i go outside i don't look at i don't switch on any lights at all um you guys are going into winter now so ultimately people might be getting up before sunrise at which point you need to be wearing again 400 to 550 nanometer red lens blue light glasses until the sun rises because it's oh, still right. okay yeah because it's still day it's still nighttime um you should only allow blue light to hit your eyes and skin once the sun has risen so a lot of people don't know that you wear those night ones in the morning until the sun rises because a lot of us have to get up because of daylight savings and the shortening days a lot of us have to get up early um to get to work um, and we need to get up, have a shower, do those kind of things. Hence why in my house, I only have red lights. I don't have any blue light, any white LED lights. It's only red light. So during the winter time, I can switch on all the lights in the house. I don't have to put my blue blockers on. I can jump in the shower, um, get ready for work um, and, and my day and, and basically go. And how are you seen to get ready in the red light? <laughs> Oh yeah, you, you, you can see, but yeah, it, there's, there's been a few occasions where I have gone out the home with odd socks on, um, maybe one black and one blue. So yeah, it is, it is tough. Maybe, maybe plan your outfit the night before. Um, that might be easier, but yeah, that's a, it's a small price to pay odd socks for having, um, optimal sleep and, and mm -hmm. hormones. I can, I can tell you that. Um, so anyway, I've watched, watched the sunrise. Fantastic for my cortisol levels, fantastic for my serotonin and dopamine levels. Um, you know, I feel great and can go about my day. When I used to work in an office, um, I'm fortunate enough now I can work outside. Um, but when I used to work in an office and I was exposed to artificial light, I would, I would wear blue light filtering glasses. So then typically clear lenses that filter down the, the blue light without blocking it. Cause you don't want to block blue light during the day. But one hack that I also, well, two really good hacks actually that I also did was that I had regular sun breaks during the day. So just a few minutes outside every couple of hours, I went outside just so my eyes could take in the spectrum of sunlight that was present at that specific time of the day because sunlight spectral um, composition changes throughout the day. And that specific composition would then send messages to my brain saying, okay, time has moved on. My circadian rhythm can move on. But another good hack I did as well to balance the vast amount of blue light that was coming out of my laptop or coming at me from office lighting was to have a couple of salt lamps on my desk and the salt lamps would um from a light perspective you know put out pink and oranges and red lights which helped restore any of the i guess cell damage that the vast amount of blue light was doing from those artificial sources in the office and so you, you would have those going all uh, all day long then the salt lamps yeah you. absolutely okay, yeah because yeah. red light's present in the sun all day long um in various quantities but also blue light's present as well so we're trying as much as we can, not that we can ever get it exact, but trying to mimic the sun 
at specific times of the day artificially. Um, but ultimately, you need to be out getting sun breaks every couple of hours. I can't stress that enough. No matter how much you manage artificial light, if you're not getting adequate sun exposure, you're not going to have optimal circadian rhythms. Both go hand in hand. Um, then also, I'll watch the sunset. Be difficult for you guys at the moment because you're going into winter. So you'll probably still be working in an office when the sun's setting. 4.30. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if you can get outside at 4.30, just for a couple of minutes, that's going to send a message to your brain that it's nighttime is coming. So what happens during sunset is a lot of people think, oh, sunsets, it's full of reds and ambers. Yeah, that's correct after sunset. But actually, point when the sun starts to set, blue light is at its highest levels. And it is that spike in blue light just before um, sunset that actually tells our brain, right, we need to start a decrescendo effect, which is to start to rapidly lower cortisol levels and to start getting the body primed to produce melatonin later on in the day if we're in the absence of blue and green light. So a lot of people don't know that. They, they think that blue light's highest during the day and, and lowers as the day goes on, but it actually spikes at sunset. So we need to be out seeing that light at that time of the day. So even if you don't finish work at that time, get out just for a couple of minutes, get the, the, that light from the sun into your eyes. Don't look directly at the sun. Just, be, just being out in the sun is, is enough because the light is everywhere. Go in the eyes and it will get yourself ready for a good night's sleep. And are you putting a how, timer out? Like, how are you? I'd, I'd miss it. I'd be here working away and oh my goodness, there goes the sun. So I guess you, I guess we can have our, our phone. Our phone tells us when it goes, but are you, you're probably intuitively knowing. You intuitively know after time, um, yeah. once you practice it and get used to it, but just set alarms. Like everyone yeah. carries an iPhone or a Samsung around these days. So just set alarms each day for, it doesn't have to be the exact time, just, you know, 10, 20 minutes, um, before is, is fine. And yeah, if you go on the weather app on your smartphone, it will tell you exact time. Yeah, it tells of you when it goes, exactly. yeah. So just set, maybe set alarms for a week. Um, cause you can set multiple alarms and then when it goes off, right, that's my sun break. I'm going outside don't care if it's raining or cloudy, I'm still going to be able to get the light in. So that's very important. And then once that sun has set, you'll get all, obviously all the reds and ambers, which shows that blue light has now been taken out of the sun, at which point you need to be putting on, and this, this is what I do, I put on my red sleep plus blue light blocking glasses, um, because I want to be blocking 100% of the blue and the green in the 400 to 550 nanometer range. And that, and and so immediately, sorry, immediately after sunset, that's when you put them on. Because maybe I haven't been wearing them, wearing them enough then. So I should be having them on right now at seven o'clock as we're recording this. And I'm oh, staring at a screen. Yes, absolutely. Because staring at that screen, you're basically the, the, the light frequencies that are in that screen right now is telling your circadian clock that it's solar noon. So that's not good. Okay. So, um, yeah, definitely as soon as that sunset, get them on, get them straight on. Um, and that will then start prepping you know, your body into recovery and restoration phase, it will start getting melatonin secretion happening and it will put you in bed, um, you know, when, when you actually need to be in bed. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's the thing about wearing those glasses is you'll feel a different level of tired. You'll feel, gosh, I need to go to sleep and you will, will actually sleep, which is fantastic. Um, and typically, um, I'll then go to bed, you know, probably between 9 and 10 p.m. myself. Um, because I'm up, we don't have daylight savings here in WA, which is, which is a blessing. So I'm typically up about 5 a.m. with the sunrise. So I get a good, you know, eight hours sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I do, um, you know, for, from in my sleeping environment, I make sure my, my room is cool. I like lavender in my room, probably about an hour before I go to sleep because that helps oh, improve wow. something called GABA, which helps you sleep. I don't have blackout curtains. Um, but I have pretty good curtains. So what I wear is I wear a 100% um, light blocking sleep mask, um, one that we actually make ourselves. We found that when we produce this eye mask, for instance, we found that um, a lot of eye masks apply pressure to the eyes and don't actually allow you to open your eyes whilst wearing the sleep mask. So we managed to put that into our sleep mask, which is really good. Yeah, I, always, the, I started wearing a sleep mask, I just interrupted, and I was wearing a sleep mask like a year ago. And I'm like, yeah, why have I gone my whole life without a sleep mask? Like, so, and the one I have is like a silk one. So yours probably is going to be way better than that. But even even the one I have, I'm like, damn, it's like a little little cocoon. I feel so <laughs> comfortable in this little, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, the thing with, with sleeping is that, Studies have shown that number one, wearing a sleep mask improves REM sleep by 22%. So that's a no brainer. Um, but also not wearing a sleep mask. If a car drives past your window, say you haven't got blackout curtains, 
that's blue light coming into your bedroom. If there's street lights outside, that's blue light coming in. If a neighbor puts on a light, that's blue light. If you or your partner gets up in the night and uses the bathroom, that's blue light. Any kind of blue light in whilst you sleep that's hitting your closed eyes, and again, this is evidence-based, is enough to turn off melatonin production or lower it. So this is the importance of wearing a sleep mask. You might be doing all the amazing, amazing light hack protocols that I've mentioned in this, in this conversation. But if you're not putting a sleep mask on when you sleep and you haven't got 100% blackout curtains, again, you're going to be undoing all the amazing stuff that you've done during the day because that light hitting your closed eyes is going to disrupt melatonin still. And, and also slightly unrelated to, to, I guess, your audience, but people will be keen to hear it. Any kind of blue light that enters your um, closed eyes, so through your eyelids, this is just fascinating, um, whilst you sleep, is enough to cause an increase in blood glucose levels and insulin resistance by about 40 to 50% after just one night. Yeah, and that is uh, for our audience too, because people dealing with uh, insulin-related uh, PCOS, mm-hmm. and we also see a lot of um, dysregulated uh, blood, uh, blood sugar in the couples that we work with, so that's good to know. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, and it's, it's interesting you mentioned um, PCOS as well. Um, obviously, one of the biggest causes of infertility in women and two yes. hormones that I haven't really touched upon that contribute to some, you know, p- contribute to PCOS is estrogen and pro- prolactin from what I've read from a circadian standpoint. And obviously, you know, estrogen plays a huge role in the reproductive systems of women, but estrogen has actually been known to modify circadian clock genes within the reproductive system so each cell in our body has its own clock as well it's not just this one master clock that we've got every cell in our body has its own clock and estrogen estrogen has been known to modify clock genes within the reproductive system so what that means is estrogen is produced obviously in larger quantities when we sleep but if your estrogen levels become too high or too low Mm -hmm. so people might have been on maybe the contraceptive pill maybe they've got some kind of circadian estrogen disruption disruption happening through inappropriate light exposure Mm -hmm. and there'll be lots of other sort of combinations of things that can actually impact estrogen as well not just light um light just being one of them is if if they become too high or too low or run on a mismatched circadian cycle they will impact so estrogen will impact the clock genes in the reproductive system which can actually lead to issues such as PCOS, um, which, which we mentioned is one of the leading causes of mm-hmm. fertility in women. And prolactin, which in essence is, you know, um, another hormone that influences fertility in women. If those clock genes are disrupted, then they can also increase the risk of PCOS as well. And also if prolactin is not running on the correct circadian cycle. So, you know, if you're, um, disrupting a circadian cycle through inappropriate light management, you're actually going to have, you know, a decreased or, or lack of normal ovulation as well. Um, and that's been obviously uh, cited in the literature as, as, as well. And like most hormones, prolactin is secreted at higher levels during sleep and it's actually suppressed by inadequate sleep. Um, and what is inadequate sleep caused by? Principally, it's caused by the exposure to blue and green light after dark. So you can see here that wearing blue light blocking glasses after dark is not just, a, oh, brilliant, I'll get a good bit of sleep and might feel okay. You're actually going to be radically improving your hormonal, hormonal and endocrine profiles in your body, which not only is going to lead to, lead to better reproductive success, reproductive health, but also increase your quality of life and feelings of well-being, health, and, you know, general, general wellness. Absolutely. And is there anything you would like to, that you're obsessed with right now, either a, a book or a website or an app, a documentary, anything you'd like to recommend? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm sort of, uh, really into, um, a book by Dr. Sachin Panda at the moment, um, the circadian code, which is really good. I recommend anyone, um, wants to learn a little bit more about what I've spoken about to read that book. That's really, really good as well. But, um, generally I read sort of several books at one time. Um, that being one, I've, I've also sort of got an interest in, um, learning from you know sort of successful people as well so i read a lot of sort of um biographies and autobiographies mm-hmm. um so yeah that i i would suggest the circadian code at the moment i don't really watch too much tv but when i do it's typically you know discovery channel type 
documentaries um and you know i like to just sort of learn different things and not be pigeonholed into just being someone that knows a lot about light and sleep um i want to you know know a lot about other things as well i just love learning and is there a success story you'd like to share obviously yourself um anything else that comes to mind yeah i think for a, a, a one one that's close to home to me is is my wife. I, I think she's been very successful because she thought I was a, a complete weirdo when I started talking about all this stuff. Um, and it took her a couple of years to, to obviously follow in my footsteps. But mm-hmm. she, I guess, from a, a son point of view, I, I, she's really sort of had massive massive success. So she is of like Celtic origin, um, which is like um, Irish, Welsh, Scottish sort of heritage, which means that when she goes outside, no matter if she wears sun cream or not, she will burn. Um, she'll just go red. I said to her that after all the research I had done, that this was basically a sign of not adapting to the environment that you're in. You're in Australia, you need to adapt to that environment. Oh, yeah. And you can adapt to that environment by in training your circadian rhythm correctly, but also building something in your skin called melanin, which is a pigment that absorbs UV light safely. And the more melanin you have, the darker the skin you have. So hence, when you have a tan, you have higher levels of melanin, so you've got more protection against UV light. Um, and the safe way to do that is to watch the sunrise because UV levels are at their lowest. Um, build up this melanin and then you won't burn when you go out in the sun later on in the day without sunscreen or sunglasses on. Um, And this last sort of year, so from last summer, because we're obviously in the opposite, um, we're we're upside down to you guys Mm -hmm. down here in Australia. We're in the summer now, but last summer as well, she just goes a golden brown now. She doesn't burn. She doesn't wear sunscreen. She doesn't wear sunglasses. She's out in very high temperature heat, um, in high UV times and doesn't burn because she's tidied up her circadian rhythm. She doesn't expose herself to blue light, but also she's out in the sun at very safe periods during the morning when UV levels are low, building up protection against more damaging UV light later on during the day. And she's a poster child for someone that comes from a very, very pale skin background that can literally tan within an instant now and, and not burn at all. It's fascinating. Mm. I've never heard such a thing. Yeah, no, that's, that's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and so awesome. So they can um, definitely recommend checking out the blue light blocking glasses. I love my pair. As you say, I've been wearing them every night. Now I'll wear them earlier. Um, but you can go to blue block. So it's B L U B L O X.com forward slash get pregnant podcast. And I'll have the link in the show notes. Anything you'd like to share about the, the different glasses? Obviously the word recommending right now, the, um, uh, red one, the red glass, um, the red frames, sorry, the red lenses. Yes. Um, but if you're on the night shift, adding in the yellow ones would be beneficial as well. Anything else you'd like to say there? Yeah, I think that, you know, we have three different lens choices. And I think that, you know, for me, I would suggest starting with the sleep plus lenses to improve sleep, because I think, you know, the majority of people that listen to this will, you know, maybe be working nine to five and, um, you know, want to in, in, increase their, you know, their maternal health and reproductive health and general health as well. So sleep plus definitely start with those. If you're a night shift worker, you're going to need two pairs straight off the bat. Um, you're going to need a yellow summer glow pair for during your night shift. And then the red sleep plus pair for three hours before you want to go to bed um, during the day. Um, and also, you know, our remedy sleep mask as well. If people want to stop that light hitting their eyes while they sleep, very important as well. I would also recommend that um, as, as, as a good starting point as well. Shipping to Canada and the US is free, as is the rest of the world. So, you know, don't worry about that. Our website displays prices in AUD, but we have a currency converter on the website, which will show the um, prices in Canadian dollars. But the last price you'll see at checkout will always be AUD because we're obviously Australian. Obviously, take a bunch of the discount code um, for 15% off. That's that's a given. That will save some money. And yeah, it's it's just well worth doing. It's easy exchanges as well. Um, you know, for some reason they don't work out for you 30 days to try them and then you can send them back if you, if it's, you know, they're not for you, but we literally haven't had that yet, which is amazing. You know, everyone absolutely loves these glasses and they're just absolutely astounded by how good their sleep is following the usage of, of them just after one, one use. So, you know, I think that's, that's central. I think 
supporting your own health, you're also supporting our charity mission as well. I think that's worth noting. For the last couple of years, we've worked with Restoring Vision in um, the United States, who are a not-for-profit. So for every pair of blue light glasses we sell, we gift a pair of reading glasses to Restoring Vision, who then donate them to someone in the developing world. Mm. So it's part of our Buy One, Gift One campaign. So you know, you won't be just helping yourself, you'll be helping someone that can't afford to help themselves as well. Wonderful. And so that, yeah, that discount code was get pregnant podcast and you get 15% off. And also to know you have some really cool uh, styles. Like these are like, these are just, they are really nice glasses. Like some of them, some of the blue light blockers out there are clumsy and ugly. These are sleek and sexy and they, they are beautiful. So that's to note Thank as well. You. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was a really good point, actually. Yeah, because we we founded the company because we didn't like the safety goggle type mm-hmm. look as well. So we we picked out and designed some really super fashionable frames. We've got like aviators in there, Clubmaster star ones, um, you know, tortoise shell, clears. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's about twenty different frames to choose from, and we do them for kids as well. So you know, and one other good point to note as well. Two things is. Um, we work with an optics lab, so we do prescription glasses, right. reading glasses, very easy to do. So you don't have to wear clunky fit over glasses or clip on lenses. And we also do a custom service as well. So if you've got a really nice pair of frames that you want turned into blue blocks, blue light blocking mm-hmm. glasses, we can do that as well. You just send them to us and we put our lens technology in, in them for you. Nice. Love it. Great. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, sharing your words of wisdom on this topic. This is just like fascinating. I think uh, it's really going to help a lot of people. So thanks again, Andy, for coming on. Thank you so much for having me on, Sarah. And yeah, if we can help just one person from, from this show, I'm happy. Hey there. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. Melatonin is important for female fertility. It helps regulate hormones and maintain the body's circadian rhythms. Plus it helps determine the frequency and duration of the menstrual cycle. Plus it impacts sperm count and motility. Blue and green light negatively impact our melatonin production. That's why we recommend blue blocks, blue and green light sleep glasses to all our one-to-one clients. Simply go to blue blocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code Get Pregnant Podcast at checkout to receive your 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code Get Pregnant Podcast. The Get Pregnant Naturally Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.